If you enjoy these programs, please like and subscribe. Why is he called Jesus of Nazareth? Why not Jesus of Bethlehem? Because everyone always knew the Nazareth part. The Bethlehem is a later accretion. Yes, good morning. Uh, my name is Darren Griffin. I was, I've was i been listening to some of your um, discussions about the Bible um, in reference to uh, Christians trying to convert Jews to uh, Christianity. My question is, does he believe that a, that a person in human history named Yahshua Nazareth, or as Christians call him, Jesus of Nazareth, actually existed? Thank you. Have a great day. Yeah. Yeah, there, there's so many accretions of mythology in the Gospels in particular that it's easy to understand why there are people who think that this person never exists and is a figure like Romulus, the, uh, the mythical founder of Rome, also born to a virgin, also ascends to heaven. And Given that there were no contemporaneous historians that wrote anything about Jesus, and there were plenty in the area, famously Philo of Alexandria lived in the first half of the first century. He was born in 20 BC and lived into the 50s, a Jew from North Africa, wrote extensively, we have his works, visited the land of Israel, frequently and nothing about him and in the christian bible jesus is portrayed as having massive crowds following him in in the gospels for example when there's uh when jesus is set to heal a paralytic they can't even get in the front door because there are such enormous crowds uh, they have to let him in through a uh, through a hole in, in the roof. When you have the thousands and the feeding thousands, there are many people who think none of this existed. Uh, there was no historical Jesus, and it's a later uh, invention. And it's difficult when looking at the ancient world to know, to be able to know what is real, what is what is legendary. M you, you certainly can't, this is not a hard science, so you can't know, like, can't be sure of it, but it, to me it seems like it is far more likely that there was a figure who lived during the first third of the first century who came from Nazareth, and I'm, I'm really glad that you mentioned Jesus of Nazareth. And it's, it's striking that he's called Jesus of Nazareth. He's not called Jesus of Bethlehem. Why is that? Why Jesus of Nazareth, not Bethlehem? Because Bethlehem is also, that's certainly a myth. I mean, being born in Bethlehem um, only appears in Matthew and Luke. And this is going to become very important because the the story telling the plot in only two Gospels where we have an infancy narrative, uh, the plot devices are completely different. So for those who are not familiar with this, there are 89 chapters in the Gospels. Of those 89 chapters, only four of them tell us about Jesus' birth. Two of them in Matthew, two of them in two of them in the book of Luke. That's it. There's no mention of any virgin birth in Paul's letters. There's nothing about it. Well, we might expect to find it in the book of Mark, but Mark is written earlier. The virgin birth wasn't invented yet. Or you could believe that Mark knew about it, but just didn't think it was important enough to mention. But that's, um, that's not a very persuasive argument. So now here, here's where we go with Nazareth. I think that Nazareth, the fact that Nazareth appears in both infancy narratives is very compelling, especially because of the contradictory nature 
of Matthew's infancy narrative and Luke's infancy narrative. In very quickly, Luke's infancy narrative tells a story about Mary and Joseph who are originally from Nazareth. And then because of a census, they have to travel to Bethlehem. And you know the story, there's no room at the inn and they wind up in a, a barn and Jesus is born in a manger. Well, there's a reason why none of that is in Matthew. So in Luke, they're in, they're in, they, the couple, their hometown is, is Nazareth. They then make their way to Bethlehem because of some census, a worldwide census where people had to move back to the ancestral home of their great, great grandparents going back a thousand years. Is, of course, it's silly. In, during, during a census, people don't move. Census takers move. But I want to just set that aside for a moment. The, the baby Jesus is born in a barn in Bethlehem. And then following that, the couple goes back to Nazareth, which is in the Upper Galilee, stopping along the way in Jerusalem where Mary brings the, the appropriate sacrifice for a new mother. That is wildly different than Matthew. It's it's not even uh, compatible in a- any way. Even Christian scholars who are evangelicals can see this is very problematic. Matthew has the family begin in Bethlehem, and they have to go to Egypt because Herod is looking to kill the kid. And this is in Matthew chapter 2. So Joseph is told to go to Egypt. So they go down to Egypt and they were there until Herod died. When it's now they're going back from Egypt, it's so completely different. They will, of course, want to go home to Bethlehem because Bethlehem is home. There's no manger. There's no problem with room at the inn. Why would you stay at an inn down the block if your house is there? Uh, but rather, Joseph is informed in Matthew that uh, there's a new Herod that's uh, come to power, Herod Archelaus, who's crazier than his dad. Um, so you need to avoid Judea. Judea is basically whatever's below Jerusalem. So you better go off to Nazareth. So the family then goes to Nazareth rather than home. So these two stories, are it's not that they're, um, they're contradictory. They're just entirely different. Um, it's not like these are variances. The story is just um, hopelessly uh, unreconcilable. But there is something striking in all this um, fiction. Why Nazareth? So it's sort of baked into your question. Why Nazareth? And Jesus will be known as Jesus of Nazareth rather than Jesus of Bethlehem. So we can figure out very easily why Matthew and Luke want the baby Jesus to be born in Bethlehem. They use different plot devices, but they get him born in Bethlehem. Why Bethlehem? Because Bethlehem, after all, is the birthplace of King David. So they want him born in the city of David, the city that King David was, is born in. And David was called a a person from Bethlehem, see 1 Samuel chapter 17. But the question is the following. If Jesus was completely fictitious, he's like a Romulus character, there was no such person, then why do you need uh, Nazareth? Why not just tell the story of Jesus was born born in Bethlehem, and that's where the family was always, and why do you need the Nazareth part? And Nazareth is a place that no one ever heard of. And it's never mentioned in Tanakh, ever. And even though Matthew 2.23 will say there's a verse to support Jesus going to Nazareth, uh, there is no such verse. That's a phantom verse. It doesn't exist. So 
Nazareth is mentioned nowhere. It's not mentioned at Talmud. It's not. It's just. It's just nothing. If, if archaeologists are correct who at the end of the 20th century, archaeologists have concluded they found the Nazareth of the New Testament. I'm not an archaeologist. If they're right that they found Nazareth, then it really is literally a one-horse town. It's a nothing of a place. So why invent that? Why insert it? Why interpolate that? So I think strangely and counterintuitively that the fiction in the New Testament, the fact that Matthew and Luke struggle so hard to get Jesus to be born in Bethlehem, but we need to get him back to Nazareth. That's the point. Because Nazareth, everyone knows, is really where Jesus is from. And that's what goes to, why is he called Jesus of Nazareth? Why not Jesus of Bethlehem? Because everyone always knew the Nazareth part. The Bethlehem is a later accretion. It's a later insertion. And Matthew and Luke whoever wrote those books, would independently later create a plot device in order to explain that all. So we know he's from Nazareth, but we need to get him born in Bethlehem. And each one independently comes up with a plot device. Why? Why work so hard? So that points me in a direction that, in fact, the Nazareth part is historical. Jesus from Nazareth, uh, from a, just the a nothing of a town in the Upper Galilee. These, you know, these are for those of you who live in large countries. Um, these are very small distances. Like Bethlehem to Nazareth in distance is, I don't know, it's less than a hundred miles. Definitely way less than that. But it's less than a hundred miles. It's not that far at all. It's just a, you know, it's a journey that would take less than a week. So these are not, you you know, just Israel is just a very tiny. There are only four states in the United States that are smaller than Israel. So it's a very small place. So the, the fiction in the Christian Bible, um, if this is counterintuitive, indicates to me that there really was a figure from Nazareth, the Bethlehem part comes up later, and that would explain why they work so hard, but why the Nazareth part sticks. It sticks so much that, you know, you have even people speaking of Nazareth derisively, like, what good thing can come from Nazareth? Like, right, because, like, what good thing could come from a place like Nazareth? It was such a small nothing of a town. So I think that is way more likely that Jesus is a historical figure. All the stuff you're reading in the Gospels, that stuff is just legend um, that just built and built in later levels, accretions. And, of course, as you would expect, John is going to be a far more processed uh, gospel than the book of Mark, which... You know, we after the Incipit, we're introduced to Jesus as an adult, as baptism. So Mark is much more bare, easier to read, intriguing in many ways. But these are layers and layers of legend. But I think in that, I think we can see that we are likely, more likely than not, um, encountering a historical figure. Last point, for the Jewish people, there's only one question. We're not interested in... In, you know, history of what we we want to know: um, who is the Mashiach? What is God's plan for of salvation for the world? That's what we're interested in. And given that, these are not questions that religious Jews typically ask. But we rather ask the question: What does Isaiah say about the true Messiah? So we open up Isaiah. Two, we look at Isaiah 11. Those are not the only Messianic chapters in Isaiah, but they are the most famous. And we drink the water from Tanakh, and from there we know that the Messiah is going to bring about the very things that Jesus did not, and that is a worldwide peace and the ingathering of the exiles and the building of a Beis HaMikdash and the universal knowledge of God. And please, God, we will see those prophecies expressed by Ezekiel and Jeremiah and Isaiah quickly in our time. Thank you for your question. If you enjoy these programs, please like and subscribe. <laughs>
בטרם כל יציר נברא ועת נעשה בחפצו כל אזי מלך, אזי מלך שמו נקרא ואחרי כפלות הכל לבדו ימלוך נורא 